X, even now, is very much institutionalised. His state of mind was, although his conviction had been quashed, he were in court for maybe a minute. So he didn't feel that justice has been done to him. Didn't trust no one. I was isolated. I was on my own. I had to try and start again. That's my uncle Alan. And that's my mum's brother. And that's my mum's sister. And uh, they died in 97 and 98. So I was away, even though I passed away. Away, what do you mean by that, mate? I was in prison. Come back to all my family. Gone. To my family, I just looked like the same person that just been away on holiday. To me, I'd come out of an institution where it's brutal, hard, tough, frightening. You live in fear every day. So you don't come out normal in that environment. And then I come out and I've got to try and teach children where I've been. And I can't even explain that to any one of you lot. Any one of them ministers that say, yeah, give him a life, let him go to prison, bang him up, put him behind his door 24 hours a day, and when he comes out, he'll be all right, he served his sentence. You've just created a psycho, or, or a man that needs help. And to do that to someone that hasn't done anything wrong, and he's got to come out and try and make sense of it, it's double whammy. I think Egg understood that there are honest police officers out there. You know, if it wouldn't be for some honest police officers, he wouldn't have got out of prison when he did. But he doesn't trust the police. How can you ever trust these people? This is all funded by the taxpayer. Where do I go? What point can I go to the police and say, I want to make a complaint, knowing it's going to go to their mates? My dad come home one day in 1985 and said, I bought a cemetery. Your instant reaction is, what do you mean you bought a cemetery? Everything about Brookwood is big. It's, you know, the largest cemetery in Britain. It's probably the largest cemetery in Western Europe. When it opened, it was the largest cemetery in the world, and it was designed to cater for all of London's dead uh, forever. That was the original plan. We have the Sultan of Oman buried here, architects, Artists, actors. All five Rupert the Bear, Thomas Hawksley. We've got our own actors, Aka. We've got our own Swedish, Latvian. It's a huge multicultural community. And we have to remember that we also have the relics of a saint here in the form of St Edward the Martyr. And he's the oldest person whose bones are buried here. All right, this is where my mum and dad is. We're at my um, my mum and dad's uh, tomb, and I come here every day. I, I like the incense stick. I I say a little prayer, and uh, they give me the strength to carry on. I absolutely love and respect them both, and you know it's it's hard. My father-in-law obviously owned the cemetery and he had a funeral business, funeral directors, and I used to help him out in London. His offices were in Green Lanes. And one day, um, Onda, who is Egg's brother, and I had gone to the airport to deal with the body that was being repatriated, a deceased. We came back from the airport, walked into the office and she was there. She was sitting there. Seeing her in his office, was a bit out of the ordinary. He was a Turkish Cypriot man who very rarely had anyone visit him that wasn't Turkish Cypriot. And that was the first time I ever saw her. As time went on, she was around more. And I remember one day I went for breakfast. I had a key to the house, so I went in myself. And she came out of the shower in a dressing gown. So I was quite taken aback by her, really. But it turned out that 
towards eight months or eight and a half months, I was told by somebody that she, I think it was by Onda that she was pregnant and having a baby. So obviously that shocked me. I think after that she spent more time with Ramadan and she moved in to the cottage, the Glades house at the cemetery with him. I met Diana prior to my working here um, in my capacity uh, with the Brookwood Cemetery Society. For several years she passed herself off as, as Ramadan's wife and I wasn't the only person who was taken in by this, um, you know, lie because, you know, it was only subsequently that I learned that they, they weren't married and that she was only one of Ramadan's girlfriends. I've been away for all that time. She's had her feet under the table. She's worked out the family's strengths and weaknesses, all my sisters, and she manipulated my dad. She'd play a game. You know, she was very good. This is a business transaction for her. Let's face it, what does a 36-year-old woman want with a 70-year-old man? This woman's got a history for selling her own baby three times. Um, this woman's got a history of Princess Diana and Dodie Fired. When they died, she went to Al Fired and claimed to have had Dodie Fired's love child. Now, you've got to be quite a nasty piece of work to approach a man that's just lost his son in a tragic car accident and claimed to have his baby for financial gain. So there was that information that he knew about. So even then, I think Ramadan had doubts himself, but it wasn't somebody that he was going to marry because he made it quite clear he was not going to marry anybody. I said, what have you done? He said, I'm going to Cyprus. I know I've made a mistake. We finished. This was 2004. On top of everything else, the, my state of mind, you know, we've got to remember I was away for all that time and I've come out and I'm trying to, to function, not, not, not get on, function. You know, I was trying to explain to my dad, look, dad, you know, I'm trying to, I need help. I, I'm not ready to do this. And slowly, slowly, we were getting things together. Ramadan and Egg had quite a um, close relationship. They used to travel back and forth to Cyprus together. If he went on meetings, they would go with him. 2006, my dad died. I haven't had three years. When they got there, he immediately rang up and said, you know, my dad's been murdered. We coming back from Cyprus with my dad, when we just witnessed his autopsy, which was horrific. We were waiting for the autopsy report. They messed us about out there. Um, we knew the plot was thick. Um, we, my dad didn't drink. He just simply didn't drink. Then they're turning around in Cyprus and saying, he'd taken Viagra, he was shagging this Turkish bird, right, and he died on the job. That's a fantastic way to go. But that's not what happened. Because of the mysterious circumstances, they were advised to bring Ramadan back to England after the post-mortem that was had in Cyprus to have a proper post-mortem here because of the foul play. Obviously, Diana was left at the cemetery because she used to work here. And she'd arranged for Ramadan to go into an area of the cemetery where he is now in a vault with Suela. But when Egananda came to the cemetery to try and sort things out, they'd been told by the groundsman that Diana had told him on the day of the funeral that the cemetery was going to be sold. I'm faced with this fraudster. We've come back ready to go back to Cyprus because they've applied for a letter of administration in Cyprus. At the airport, she's claiming that she's been tied up. Two Turkish looking people have come in demanding papers from a Turkish estate or the Turkish paperwork. That's a load of products. And I remember Egg ringing me. I was in London saying, can you go to Brookwood? Apparently, Diana's um, there was a robbery, she's been tied up at gunpoint. I called her up and said, Diana, are you OK? What's going on? She never answered the phone, but I managed to get her and she said, yes, I'm fine, the police are here. All the relevant paperwork's been nicked. So we don't know exactly what's been nicked until time's gone on and hearings have been had. Then the documents are starting to show. She's nicked everything. I knew exactly what was going down. The police, when I reported the police, to what they was going on. They weren't dealing with me as a victim. 
They were dealing with me as a suspect of the fucking robbery she set up. We didn't find out until um, the June 2007 that she, became, she made an application to become the administrator of this state, but by, before doing that, she'd asked for a caveat that the children of Ramadan Gune cannot become the administrators of the estate. She'd already applied for a letter of administration before we could get our foot in the door. They'd give it to her. She knew that the children were gathering the information together to complete the IHT form, which is the inheritance tax form, and become the administrators. And all that, that time she was paying everybody along. I believe one of the reasons I was asked to assist in the office is, is, is the incredible chaos that was left here um, after she decided to walk out one day in June 2007. She booked to go away. I think her mother was ill, so they, she went away. She didn't come back on the day she was supposed to. She came back the Tuesday. Um, and on the Wednesday, she came back half a day. She said to Lee, who was helping Egg out here, that she was going to go home to get a sandwich and walk the dog and never came back. Ever? Ever. From the evidence that I've seen, um, it appeared that she was um, taking cash payments in full for uh, funerals or reserved plots, and she was not entering the full amount in the records, of the company records, and because it was cash, of course, there's no audit trail of where the full sum of money went, but we assume that she was walking off with the cash. My first point of action was to call the police, even though I didn't have much faith in the system, but this weren't about me. This was about my dad's murder, and this was about what she'd done and what was coming next. I was employed as a civilian investigator for Surrey Police. In early 2008, I was asked to um, take on an investigation, an alleged fraud investigation, which involved Brookwood Cemetery and Mr. and Mrs. Gunny. The allegation was that um, a lady by the name of Diane Holliday, a former partner of Mr. Ramadan Gunny, that she stole monies from the estate and also from Mr. Gunny. This was over a period of time while she was employed here as a company secretary stroke office administrator. I interviewed Melanie Gunny and John Clark, the, the cemetery historian. They both made statements to me, lengthy statements, in which they both produced a number of documentary exhibits in support of the allegation against Diane Holliday. Roger struck me as someone who was extremely professional. He's a fraud specialist, as I understand, and I, I think he'd actually worked out at a very early stage exactly what Diane was up to. It was an easy fraud. You know, we've got in our documents £470 pound and she's dishing out invoices for 3500 Where's that money going? She's handwritten invoices, giving them to a client. They're turning up. We ain't got no deed. We paid Diana in cash. We look at the documentation. She's nicked the money. It's black and white. The whole process of completing that stage of my investigation for Surrey Police took from the beginning of May to the mid-July 2008. Nothing, nothing. I saw Egg all the time because he was hands-on in running the business. Obviously, the grounds here uh, uh, take a lot of upkeep, so he was in and out of this building, where he lives, by the way, um, all the time. We were approached by the prolific offending team. Egg was trying to do his bit for society, really, and help offenders. Because I've been in that situation. No one wants to employ anyone that's got form of being in and out of prison and GBH and all that stuff. You know, we've got 460 acres here. We need all the help we can get. I thought, 
why not? We give give it a shot to ch show good faith to the police. One of the guys that came to us anyway, he had history of working here who we knew and uh, we basically had no chance of any employment because of his history. And then off the back of that, why are we relying on the same police, Hendy and Molyneux? I think Molyneux, one of Molyneux's jobs was to um, find replacements for people that can't get jobs. And they stuck this Shamaradi into us, got him interviewed. He was going to be deported. He'd just come out for, I don't know what it was, beating someone up. He was a horrible man. And I remember speaking to Egg about him and saying, you know, I don't feel comfortable with him here. There's something not right about this bloke. He was asking me all sorts of questions, what my issues were and everything else, and what's that all on the car, the untouchables and everything else. He was speaking to all the staff, all the usual stuff that an informer would be trying to do. It was sort of a, almost a running joke that if you were out with Egg, anyone who he didn't immediately recognise was probably you know, an undercover officer or something like that. And I just took it as part of, you know, the way Egg was because of what had happened to him before with his major miscarriage of justice. He crossed the line. Um, I pulled him up. He, in fact, um, defecated on the cemetery, which is, you know, the insult doesn't get any worse than that. I lost my rag. I said, you out of here. We spent years trying to get people to stop bringing their dogs here for that. And I'm paying you and you're going to shit on my grounds. So got rid of him. The next minute I heard he got nicked for beating some poor kid up in a club. Nicked his phone and his money or whatever. He's found himself in custody. And uh, the next minute he's ringing me up. Listen, bruv. Who is it? What is it? It's me, bruv. Um, Shabba, or whatever his name was. I said, yeah, well, what's happening? Where are you? Oh, we know it, Dan, bruv. Uh, but listen, I've got, I've got my own ting, my own phone in, in Idan. I've done 18 months cat A in Idan. 18 months cat A. There's no way on earth you can have a phone in Idan. No way. I don't care who you are. Even if you've got a screw on side, you're going to have difficulty keeping a, a phone. I'm going to send my, my, my mate to come and see about that, that job, that thing. Yeah? What, what thing? Don't say too much. What are you talking about? All that kind of stuff. My head's ticking. I'm on the phone. Fucking line up. He's gone wrong. He's got sacked. So they're on him saying, right, you've got to fix this. You've screwed this up. You're going back to Iraq. Or you better line something else up. And that was their angle. We tried to get him a lawyer. No, 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 I've got a lawyer. We've got our own criminal law firm. So when he didn't accept that? Yeah, it, we, you know, it just was confirming my beliefs that he was on their side and he was lining me up. I think there might have been two or three phone calls, but every time he phoned me, it was getting quieter and I could hear the hand movements. It was like the copper. I had this vision of him sitting in the, the room and the copper saying to him, I'll ask him about this. I could see it, you know what I mean? Because you're there. Call me paranoid. But I've got good reason. Anyway, cut to the chase. He's going to stick his mate into me to help me out. Yeah, 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 send him down. Come down here. Yeah? Zaf. All right. Shamarad is mate. We are you looking for a contract killer? Thinking to myself, this is the best I can do. This cunt, Shamaradi, I was just come out of Camp Hill Prison on licence to work in the cemetery. I've caught you shitting in here and this bloke in a jag turns up is your best mate. It don't work, mate. Right? This geezer was a copper. The only thing that was missing was a flashing light. So I thought, oh, here we go. Yeah, bruv, I can do this, I can do that. I said, what can you do? I can run a rover on. I thought to myself, this is fucking getting out of hand. Who is behind this? I've moved out of London to get away from all this shit. I live in the middle of a cemetery and you're knocking on the door asking me who's from Hackney, North London. I know every face. If I wanted to call in a favour, there ain't no one that I can't ring. I spent a long time in prison 
And the only people I was hanging around with were murderers, were drug dealers, gangsters. So I'm not going to rely on some scab from Woking to send me his mate who turns up and tells me he's a contract killer. The lead up to this, I've had two more approaches. This is the third approach. First time, the kids are knocked on the door, contract killer. Second time, this is mate, are you having a bit of bother? I'll just piss off, mate. Third time, all right. Right, now I'm thinking, let me get these lot exposed. My intention was solely to expose the people that were on this operation, to get these lot out of the way, to then say, right, stop fucking about with me, get this shit out of the way, this lot's all working with Diana, investigate this, my dad has been murdered. He phoned me and told me that this was going on before it all escalated. He said to me that these people are about, the police are phoning in, they're trying to fit him up again. You know, he's just come out of prison for seven years and uh, he's been, you know, given the cemetery and all of a sudden the Surrey police are on his case. It's really strange. And you can't help but feel that Diana and the police are involved in this whole thing. While that was all going on, uh, Roger Sprickley was here taking information and exhibits of the fraud. You didn't notice anything at that point that would indicate that Egg was up to anything untoward? Certainly not, no. Up, what he was up to, no. Most of the time he's, he's quite relaxed, but he's, his personality changes from time to time. When something's worrying him, then he's prone to outbursts. Now this is after the first copper, Laura Hendy, that I've reported for failing to do her job. The second copper, Molyneux has felt to do her job. I've got Roger Sprickley in front of me. So you believed Roger knew all about this? Of course he did. Why shouldn't I at that time? Why shouldn't I? There was no reason. It's a copper. They're all coppers. Everyone's a copper as far as I'm concerned. How can I trust anybody? He would always say to me, I'm being followed. I've just come back from this one. The police have followed me. Somebody knocked on the door, said they were looking for Diana. Someone knocked on the door saying, I understand you want to get rid of Diana. And I just used to say, I think, as I always thought, that he's paranoid, he's over paranoid, being here at the cemetery on his own driving him mad. I never had an inkling. If I had, I would have put a stop to it. So the whole scenario was, uh, I come back and speak to her, Zaf. I got to meet him. He said, I want you to meet me here. I don't know this area too well. I said, no, 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 I don't know where that is. Meet me at Sainsbury's. Because I've been there a few times. I could see if anything was, you know, going on. And if I'd get shot, it'd be on CCTV. I go in the truck. Truck's got Brookwood Cemetery on it. I'm not making a secret about who I am. But when I meet him, I said to him, you're a copper. He says, I'm not a copper. No, bruv. I said, you're a copper, mate. No, bruv, I'm not. I said, all right. So we started driving around, go around my dad's house, where Diana's occupying. So as we're driving around, he knows exactly where he's going. He's driving a Jag. And while we're in the car, I said, listen, how much do you want? What do you mean? I said, what do you want? Five, ten grand? Tell me who you're involved with. What's going on? Who's executed the warrant? Just tell me. Nah, bruv. I said, listen, it's going to get messy, mate. He weren't having it. He's still making out. Anyway, I said, pull over here quickly. Pulled over. I said, quick, jump out of the car. Jumped out. And I've turned around, seen the Audi, I've seen the BM, I've seen another silver car. I said, you fucking cunts. Yeah, I know who you lot are now. Come back here. And I said to Roger, I've just left one of your mates. I said, it's going to get messy. And I was completely gobsmacked. I was completely taken aback. I said, what, what are you talking about? I said, you know what I'm talking about. You're trying to line me up. You're trying to set me up. You know what I'm talking about. He says, I don't know what you're talking about. It was random. It was a random sort of thing. I mean, in one minute, I'd be sitting here talking. I might have been talking to John Clark. I don't know, in relatively quiet situation. And an egg would come bursting in through the door and say things like, you know, what are you doing? Are, are you a plant or something like that? Are you fitting me up? You part of what's going on? I just thought that as this became a regular feature, that it was just part of his makeup, and perhaps it was part of the way he tried to cope with the fact that he'd never been, you know, he never got closure on his original um, imprisonment. He wasn't told who the corrupt officers were. This was all hidden under the PII 
um, legislation. And I think I, I can sympathise that if, if you're not told the facts, you know, why should you believe what the authorities are telling you? I play role him to try and expose them. Do the job. How much do you want? Oh, I want 10 grand, bruv. I said, OK. Um, when you do the job, you ring me up and you tell me the paint is dry. And uh, the knob rings me up a couple of weeks later. I'm ready, bruv. I've got a big, heavy car. I'm going to do this, going to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He kept pestering me. I need a bit of money up front, bruv. I, need... I said, you ain't getting a fucking penny to do the job. We agreed. The code word was, the paint is dry. He rings me up a couple of weeks later. It's early morning. The paint is dry. I said, did you put enough lacquer on it? And laughed. I said, you silly cunt. Oh, bruv, bruv, I said, I can't talk to you now. I put the phone down. I think they thought I was going to drive down the road and have a look at a crime scene, um, which I later found out that there was a crime scene tent. They smashed up a golf, helicopters up in the air. The money they spent on that operation, had they spent a little bit of that investigating Diana's background and her fraud and what I was saying, they would have done and dusted with the case. That weren't the intention. Their intention was to finish me off. Around about the middle of July 2008, I thought I had sufficient evidence for a further stage of the investigation to take place in relation to the allegation of fraud. So I handed the file over to the supervising officer of mine at uh, Woking Police Station. The whole case was taken out of my hands completely and uh, I had nothing further to do with it at all, which surprised me. The next day I was in the police station talking about the fraud investigation that I'd done and I was told not to worry about that because um, nothing further would be happening as Erkin Gunny had been arrested and was in custody charged with incitement to commit murder. What happens next? I've got to leave the country. I've made a right mess of her. I've had to go over her backwards and forwards and all that bollocks. It can't. Who are you talking to? I think, yeah, we're all right. Come on, I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm waiting. My whole achievement was to get arrested so I can see who'd execute the warrant, and then I could start from that point backwards. Listen, bruv, it keeps ringing me. He goes, where are you, bruv? I said, I'm on my way. He said, where are you going? I haven't told you where I am. I said, oh yeah, where are you? I was never going to meet this geezer because I know I'm being walked into a trap. I take the phone, battery, card out, throw the phones on the floor. Fuck you, right? I'm getting on with my day. I was expecting them to come in the morning, nick me, and have a day in at the police station, get my brief there, and get this all out in the open. It didn't work like that. In sight by say, I didn't think they were coming, or if they were coming, I thought they are coming loaded. Guns, drugs, going to set me up again. About 8, 8.30 was it, um, a whole load of cars uh, came through the gates and all these people got out and um, someone who I subsequently learned, you know, was in charge of the search party, as it were, um, had a warrant for Egg's arrest. Erton uh, Gooney? I said, yeah. He said, you're under arrest for solicitation of murder. I said, really? I said, anyone been murdered? I said, no. I said, anyone been paid? I said, no. Show me the warrant. Got me the warrant. I said, there you go, Laura Hendy. As I expected, I've been complaining to her about dying on a day and this is what's been going on and I've done this to expose you lot. But well, don't say nothing until we get down the station. Now, I said to him, I'm not getting in that car until you search me. Search me, I said, now I'm getting in the car. Why did you do it there? Because I didn't want them to plant anything on me. And you had cameras, right? And I had the cameras in front of me. I didn't have a clue what was going on. Um, the whole thing was actually quite terrifying someone had managed to get a message to Mel, that's Egg's wife, who was um, at a family birthday party in London. I rang, got off the phone, I rang our lawyer to find out what was going on. He'd been taken to Woking Police Station from what I'd understood. I got in my car and I drove to the cemetery. When I walked into the cottage, they were everywhere. There was two police officers in the reception area bagging up, up exhibits. The police were, in my view, quite defensive. Um, I found them quite rude and abrupt. 
and um, it was it was terrifying. I didn't I didn't sleep properly for over three weeks after that. I asked them for their warrant. All I remember was seeing Laura Hendy's name, and. I said, oh, that's a bit of a coincidence because Laura Hendy was the police officer that investigated the um, fraud initially. But a couple of days before, or a week before, I'd written to the DI of the case because I'd seen information, correspondence, where Laura Hendy had been writing or calling Diana's lawyers saying that we were making allegations that Diana had taken stuff from the cemetery. He says, her, Diana's lawyer says to her, well, it seems they're on a fishing expedition, and Laura Hendy says, yes, probably. Get into the police station. I said, bring your mate out, Zaf. Bring everyone in here. Let's have it all out. I've done this to expose you lot so you can get on with the fucking real job. Oh, it don't work like that, Mr Gooney. I was contacted by an officer from their special um, serious crime unit at Leatherhead and asked to go over there, present myself for an interview. I was asked if, if I could recall any threats um, made in my presence or earshot. And um, I said I didn't hear anything like that, no. My feeling at the time was that that didn't suit the police. It wasn't welcomed. But they'd asked me to make a statement, and I, and I did. And I, I actually said to the officer that took it, I said, well, do you want me to tell the truth or do you want me to tell lies? I said, because that's the truth. How was your relationship subsequently with Surrey Police? Well, I haven't worked for them since. Why they started the investigation or the undercover case that they did, I'm not sure what, what was going through their head. Probably Diana banging on about Egg, because Egg needed to be out of her way, you see. He was her obstruction. I thought it would be a matter of going down the station explaining it, exposing it, and that'd be it. Well, I was wrong. That weren't it. 